G'day, everybody, and welcome to the first episode for 2024 of the Scale HQ podcast. I feel like I need those sort of confetti, you know, the things that you blow that make all the noise. Anyway, what are they called? Party something or others, whatever they are. <laughs> welcome back to the Scale HQ podcast. I hope you had an amazing Christmas, New Year period, however you spend holidays. I hope you had some holidays or at least you had a chance to rest, restore, spend some time with some friends and family. And I really like the, I know there's some people that hate the whole New Year's resolutions. It's not so much resolutions that I like about that period, but the opportunity to think about what you want out of the year ahead, the opportunity to kind of step back, recharge, reflect, and think about your intentions uh, for the year, your goals for the year. And I really enjoy that process. Coming into this year, I've been thinking about lots, uh, and it's a really exciting year for Scale HQ. Uh, we've launched our first, we've just you know finished doing a pilot, a foundation cohort through our what was ScaleUp's roadmap program, now about to be called Eight Figure Strategy Program. Let me take a step back. I have, you know that from this, uh, from the last couple of years, if you've been a regular tuner in era, I am here to help seven figure founders, typically in the kind of one to 10, sometimes one to 20 uh, mil range, build their companies to the next level. They might be preparing for an exit. They might just want to be able to step back and install management. But if you've got a company that has good to create in the world, then my job is to bring the wisdom, the people, the resources to you, the knowledge to help you knock over strategic issues so that you can get there faster, so that you can fulfill the potential of your business because that creates value in the world. It allows you to achieve your personal goals. It makes me really happy because I feel like I've served you in the best possible way. So uh, I am building out four books and four courses around something I'm going to be calling the eight-figure way. And that is a course on growth strategy, a course on execution, on mastering execution, a course on leadership and people, and then a, finally a course on customer acquisition. You know, how do you build scalable scales and marketing systems so you can acquire customers? All of those four things you have to do well if you want to get past eight figures in value, i.e. like your business is worth 10 million bucks or more, or in revenue if, you're, if you want your business to be generating 10 million bucks or more in revenue. So if you are trying to build sustainably and to keep scaling, you have to do that well. You have to have a good growth strategy, good execution practices, good leadership in the way that you build culture and the way you recruit and empower people, and you have to get good at customer acquisition. So that is going to continue to be the focus of the Scale HQ podcast. Nothing's going to change there. I might start recategorizing things to kind of put it into one of those four buckets. And I am in the process of building both programs, i.e. like kind of courses, cohort-based programs, self-paced stuff, as well as um, there'll be a series of books that will match those programs that we will release over time. So that's that's something I got really clear about over the break. That's where I'm going to be taking Scale HQ, and I cannot wait to do that. There are also some other services that will come up, but I'm not going to tell you about them right now. Let's just let's get stuck onto the um, the ones that we're focused on. Now today, first guest of the year fits into the scalable customer acquisition category, um, and this is about marketing. This is a content B2B, particularly content marketing conversation for you. The guy's name is Robert Katai. He is a B2B content marketing specialist. He's a consultant. He's a speaker. He's just wrapped up four years of a, a podcast that was really well rated in Romania. And what I really liked about this conversation is it's really going to challenge your thinking. If you are a founder out there who has been trying to dissociate yourself from your brand, because you don't want to get you feel like if you were to have a personal brand or you're out there creating any content that you're going to somehow get like wrapped back into the machine and never be able to get out of it, or it's going to be reliant on you. I think this conversation is going to challenge your thinking around that. So this is about the sort of alignment between your personal and business brand. It's about how do you get cut through in a really noisy content marketplace where we're just bombarded all day long. How do you get some of that cut through? It's really hard for you. It's hard for your team. But Robert's got some excellent ideas and we finish off the conversation with very, very clear practical steps about how to get started, how to resource it, and it's not over-engineering it. It's super practical. So I hope you enjoy, sorry for the big uh, long lead up in uh, today's <laughs> podcast, but I really hope you enjoy today's podcast. I hope you enjoy the new formats that you might hear from me over the course of 2024. And uh, I look forward to helping you learn the eight-figure way to learn and think and act like eight-figure founders do because that is going to help you inevitably get to that same goal and level. Good luck and enjoy. Welcome to the Scale HQ podcast, your weekly injection of tips and insights into the secrets of scaling. 
I'm your host, Sean Steele, and I am obsessed with figuring out how to help founders just like you who are creating real value in the world to scale up so they can fulfill their potential. I do that each week by interviewing founders who successfully scaled, experts in all the areas of business that you need to master, interviews with founders who are still on the way up, and 10-minute tutorials and reflections from me based on my experiences in creating 100 million bucks in revenue for four other companies over eight years. So let's dive in and see what gems we can find together on this week's episode of the Scale HQ Podcast. G'day, everybody, and welcome back to the Scale HQ podcast. Welcome back to our regular listeners and to anybody joining us for the first time. We're so excited to have you here. Welcome to 2024. Actually, this is our first podcast uh, for 2024. Uh, so you are the first one cab off the rank, uh, Robert. My guest this week is Robert Katai, uh, seasoned B2B marketing consultant, founder of the B2B creator newsletter. Uh, 15 years now in marketing. It makes you sound old, Robert. Uh, 15 years in uh, marketing, social media, content marketing. And you've had you know, campaigns on, I know, some of the, the bigger platforms that people would love to have their campaigns land on, like Adweek and TechCrunch and Entrepreneur. Uh, and I know you do a, a fair bit of speaking around you know, positioning and content strategy and things that are coming digitally, but all really you know, tailored to the context of B2B um, content marketing. Is that a sort of fair summary? Have I missed anything important? You just made my day, Sean, with all these great, <laughs> all these great insights and all this description. I will just took this description and send it to all my friends. Just remind <laughs> them that who I am. <laughs> <laughs> you can put it on your voicemail. I give you uh, full permission. <laughs> great. Hey, you just reach out, Robert, and because. Maybe you forget, but let's see who I am. <laughs> That's right. Just in case you forgot who I was. Exactly. Yeah, was exactly. Yeah. Well, actually, you know, we're only uh, two. And this is not something that I would usually say to somebody in Europe, but now I get to because you're about two and a half hours away from me. You're in, uh, I assume you're in Romania at the moment? Yeah, in Romania, in Cluj, Napoca, uh, Cluj, it's the last day we can say is the Silicon Valley of Romania. Okay. There are a lot of uh, there are a lot of startups, IT companies, and all these mm-hmm. technology companies uh, born in, uh, that are let's say born uh, born here. Okay, nice. Well, I'm now based in Cyprus. I think you probably uh, know that, but that means I'm you know in Australian terms, two and a half hours is like a stone's throw away because you know everything takes a long time to get to. Here. <laughs> How is the Australia. weather well, in Cyprus now? The weather's pretty actually today. It's pretty beautiful. You know, twenty one degrees, twenty degrees. It's nice, uh, but next week it's going to get to seven degrees overnight. So that will be, you know, that'll be the coldest it's been uh, so far for winter. Welcome in Europe. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah. Well, look, you know, I guess a bit of a context for our audience for today, Robert. You know, one of the focuses uh, on Scale HQ late last year and going into twenty four is uh, building more scalable customer acquisition systems for our audience, because ultimately, you know. You can get so far uh, off word of mouth and brand reputation and so on, and it's absolutely critical and important, and it is the best way to build your business. However, ultimately, if you want to keep scaling uh, and scaling with some level of predictability, you need some predictable sources of leads and sales to scale. And one of the ingredients in your marketing mix is, of course, um, content marketing. And there's a lot of founders in that kind of one to 10 mil uh, range who don't really understand content marketing and it's super noisy and it's even more noisy in the last 12 months as a result of you know chat gpt and the you know sort of proliferation of pretty dodgy um you know uh written copywriting and so on so there's a lot of stuff going on and i'm interested today in you helping the audience think through how do they cut through that noise how do they if they're trying to invest in content marketing which is going to build credibility that can be used to attract clients that can be used perhaps to bring clients through the funnel um but ultimately, we're trying to like get some cut through on that. And I'd just love to hear your ideas on how, how people can do that differently. How does that sound as a setup? Oh, wow. Okay, that's good. That's good. So let's see uh, for, from the start, who do you think that uh, will listen to this, this podcast? Uh, it's a personal, that it's a person like an executive and he wants to build his own audience or maybe it's a marketer that's behind in a company, it's behind in a startup, mm. and he wants to build this brand. So let's well, start. From that's that. a let's start there. Well, that's a great question, and maybe we should pick one because we're going to have a mix in this audience. And typically, we're going to have um, founders who are running their business, but you know, a lot of these founders are still at the stage where um, people still buy because of the founder and the founder's mm. you know personal brand credibility. Let's say they might have a recruitment firm with. 10 or 20 people, or they might have a uh, accounting firm with 
you know, 10 or 20 people. And so ultimately their personal brand in some way sits alongside that. Um, and some of these founders may have a marketing resource, but I would say they're more likely to be a lower level, you know, like content marketer or marketing coordinator, like not a marketing strategist, if you know what I mean. So mm -hmm. they're kind of making it up as they go along from a marketing strategy perspective. But if you would like, to, if, if part of your, you know, I, I, in reading some of the stuff that you've been doing, I, I got the sense that you help uh, founders really think about their personal brand um, alongside their um, business brand. So maybe let's focus on that and let's talk to those founders who recognize mm. it's actually a bit of, there's a bit of value in their story. And it may not be that they're entirely selling them, but there's two profiles happening here. You know, there's, there's yeah. some brand credibility that's actually attractive. That's really interesting because you are talking about the brand credibility and I'm just, I'm, even if I'm a digital marketer, I'm writing down everything in my notebook. I, I love having a lot of notes and just writing down and sketching everything. And mm -hmm. um, I wrote down here like two ideas with the personal brand, but mostly you emphasize it on the brand credibility. And I believe that now we are living in, in this world where, uh, Content marketing, let's say it's uh, it's everywhere. We can see every everywhere a content uh, piece. Wherever we wake up in the morning, we go to the shower, we go to the toilet, we open up our phone, we open up on LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube, WhatsApp, mm -hmm. Instagram, whatever, and there is content. And what I what I observed lately is that the brands that are starting having, especially in the B two B. B2B industry, the brands that are having uh, more traction are the brands that started like heavenly investing in, in two main strategies. One is mm -hmm. the organic content. So that's what we can see. It's happening at, at HubSpot. And yes, we can, we can take the idea on the, the product. It's good. Like the product, it's a good product. If you put it in the market, people will get understand it. It's a normal product okay. that it's solving the problem. So we have the base. Yeah. Well, yeah. But, okay. But how can we get these people like being aware of the product and being aware of the the solution the product is giving and being aware the benefits of the product is giving? So the the people today are are smarter than let's say in the past because mm -hmm. the consumer it's more aware that they are marketed. So that's really interesting because we can see this even in the B2B industry. The B2B audience is, I believe, it's, very, it's a very smart audience. So they do, don't just want to uh, buy a product if they don't understand the solution for their problem. And if they don't understand that that brand is understanding their solution. So I'm getting back to, the, to, my, to my hypothesis mm -hmm. because... There are the two brand, there are the two strategies that these big brands started like leveraging up. So it's the content marketing. And I know that I listened a few days ago, uh, an ep a podcast episode on exit five with Dave Gerard and, uh, K, uh, and, uh, I believe it was the CMO from HubSpot. And they, mm -hmm. they talked about the idea that how important is these days, not just write content, not just publish content, but this content should have like a face. So who is that face? And I'm going back to HubSpot oh, okay. because yes, Ooh. even if they are like a big company, but mm -hmm. if you look at what they are doing, like they are, they are doing sometimes the unscalable stuff and the unmeasurable stuff that now it's just like getting them a win-win situation. For example, they, they, they started like doing the SEO content and the SEO blog. But in the same time, you have Darmesh, who's like an awesome people, who's like an awesome person, who's building his personal brand, just like tweeting out, putting tweets, putting LinkedIn posts, putting blogs, putting like, let's say, uh, interviews at my first million. And he presented like how ChatGPT and how AI is working. And now he's having this newsletter where he's talking about the AI from a business and from a CTO point of view. And that's really interesting. And, and is he, Dar sorry, is, is Darmesh a HubSpot employee or he's a he's the, customer? He's one of the founders. One of the founders, so, okay. Mm. Yeah, so he's one of the founders. And because he's one of the founders, he understands also the industry, also mm. the product, and also, uh, let's say, the benefits of it. So that, mm -hmm. this is how I see it, like a founder 
when when you start something, you understand the problem. You are the one that's understanding the problem as a founder. And you as a founder understand the market, let's say, questions. Mm. Mm-hmm. So you are you are the, the bridges between your market and your product. And now mm. I believe it's your responsibility to start talking about. But you can't just go out and say that, hey, my product is the best product. You should buy yeah. my product. So mm. uh, this week we just released three features. Next week we will release two features. And the mm. other week we have like, I don't know, mm. 25 bugs fix it. Nobody yeah. cares about this. Everybody no cares yeah. about the story behind like how can you Mm. attract that attention and people are scrolling on the internet and they don't just want to see an ad that is talking about let's say the product they want to see a person that is Mm. educating or informing or let's say Mm -hmm. entertaining in a way or another so they can start building the audience. And the idea mm. on the building the audience is very interesting lately, but I somehow believe that a founder, and I'm going back to the idea that a founder to build credibility, the founder should start like helping people, not because he wants to build an audience and he wants to build the credibility, because it's in DNA to help people. Mm. So if you're and a to, founder... And to understand and solve that problem that the business was built around in the first place. Exactly. Mm. So if you're a founder, that's very interesting. When you're a founder, you are focusing on your product and you're focusing on your market, on, on your audience and who are your mm-hmm. audience. But many founders, they are just like, let's say, ignoring the idea that now they have this platform. Now they have this free platform, like all the social media channels, all the mm-hmm. all the podcasts, all the newsletters, and just... Take that 10% of your time on a week basis and just create Mm -hmm. the kind of content. And I know that not many founders are like, for example, content creators, but sorry. But in the same time, they are creators because they somehow create the solution for a problem. And I know that I'm talking a lot about the solution, the problem and the benefits. But here is, let's say, the real insight that many of us are ignoring it. So how I see that is that the founder, even if he's running the business, even if they, they want to, let's say, build the credibility, they should start like just creating weekly, let's say daily if they can put it. But first time, let's start weekly for six mm-hmm. months, start down for 30 minutes every week you create and the other 30 minutes you just start and co- talking with people we have the ceo of databox who is saying that he's posting daily on linkedin and that's mm. helping him and and databox is databox they are pretty big and that's helping him like getting all the customers insights testing out features testing out the messages uh mm. testing out ideas and just spreading the message and I'm sorry, one of the one of the biggest uh, responsibility of a founder is to evangelize the product. So mm. the 2020 idea on just putting out your product outside and talk about your product, that's that. Now we are living in the world where people are aware to that they are marketed. So that's why you as a founder, you must understand how can you connect easier with your uh, audience so you can build that that bridge. And you don't create content because you want to build an audience. You create yeah. content because you want to help somebody. So when you have that audience of one in your mind, now your life will change. Let me let me pause there, uh, Robert, because I think it's really it's a super interesting topic. Like I'm just you know as you're talking, I'm thinking about a lot of the founders that I know and that I connect with on a regular basis, and. I know many of them are, you know, a little bit scared of being the sort of face of the brand. They're a little bit, okay, maybe they're, they might be, okay, technology wise, they're probably already, they might be in their, you know, 40s, 50s, 60s, whatever. And actually, okay, so one part is then maybe not as, uh, you know, current with, you know, technology and platforms and Snapchat and Instagram, whatever. But more importantly, I think they are, they are nearly all, are building their business because they want to be able to exit at some point in the future. I mean, yes, they built their business because they want to solve a problem and they thought they could do it really effectively. So they built this business. Great. 
after a period of time, they're going to want some kind of a return on that sacrifice. That might be stepping back and installing management. That might be a partial sell down to management. That might be a full exit and I want to do something else, whatever it is. And so I think a lot of them would go, I'm scared of the idea that um, I'm going to become part of our marketing machine when I'm working really hard to build this brand that sort of almost doesn't involve me and is actually a little bit faceless. Um, but what's really interesting and uh, what I hear you saying, and I think this is very true, in a world where we are saturated with uh, content and if your business doesn't have you know, some massive big point of differentiation, you actually do things pretty similar to a bunch of other people and you just maybe you do it a bit better or maybe you're a slightly different brand, that's, that you can still build a good business that way. You don't have to, it doesn't have to be the most different thing in the world. However, then how do you get some cut through with that brand? And those founders, what I do know is they are talking to people in their industry every day. They are still talking to customers every day. They are still thinking about the problem and how do you solve that problem better? And what are the problems in the industry? And to your point, they're almost the only person in the business, maybe not entirely the only person. I've definitely seen some effective sort of, you know, employee content strategies, but they have to be pretty carefully selected because they have to be the right, you know, kind of, and they're going to be coming with a different perspective. They're not going to be talking about what's going on in the industry because they're not out there dealing with the major stakeholders, dealing with the other CEOs, talking to the biggest customers, you know, thinking about what's happening in the next five, 10 years. And that is really interesting content and if you think about if you're a founder listening to this and you go i don't think anybody really cares about my story my story is not that interesting it's not like this is a hero brand they're not coming to my pest control company because um you know i had some amazing experience around pest control i, I didn't have a great experience. i didn't have some amazing you know game-changing um, scenario however i'm sure nearly every founder will find if they look at their google analytics for their website they'll find that the about us page um, on their home on their website is probably the second most visited page after the homepage because um, everybody's curious about who are these people behind this thing what what are they about like beyond the the product the service does it meet my need who like what is the character who is it the person that I'm I'm buying from it's kind of like I guess if you go back to a Simon Sinek you know um, they care about the why you know they care about why should I care about these people why should I do business with these people and they want to connect with a personality. Uh, and I think the founders could do a really interesting job of uh, evangelizing the brand by actually, to your point, don't, it's not some, it doesn't have to be some heavily curated, beautifully planned, perfectly produced kind of, you know, show stopping content strategy. But if you're out there talking to, um, you know, customers in industry, we're sharing that on a podcast, sharing that on a video, sharing that in a newsletter, sharing that in a, in a format that makes sense to you that you find easy to work in um that's natural for you if you like talking do it on a podcast or a video if you like to, I mean, if you like writing do it on a blog or you know there's lots of ways and it gives a real asset to your team because at different points through the sales process you may not be the one i, I don't think it's about if you're doing that that you all of a sudden have become um the one dependent for sourcing customers not that actually if you think about a buyer's journey and at some point they become aware of your brand and then they become interested and then they start you know evaluating you versus competitors there's all sorts of different points where your team would be stoked to have a an interview with the founder or you know last week's commentary from the founder about this is what's going on in the industry it actually helps your entire business sell or you know connect with your potential customers in the marketing process and no one can do that in the same way a founder can mm. um yeah it's, i think it's a really interesting way of getting cut through because i think it is more cluttered and therefore that is one of the only things that is truly unique uh, about your business that nobody can take away from you is your perspective uh, at the top there are you said like a lot of stuff here and i just started like writing down so let's put it like that you are scared the idea of being a part of your marketing machine and that's mm. interesting but and you just want to see what's the return of your investment or your sacrifice so you want to let the board that it's starting let's say building it and you're starting like being scared being the idea of the idea of being the marketing machine scared and what people will say about you but in the same time you are talking with the audience. You are talking with your customers. You are just, I don't know, let's say, 
talking with a lot of people because that's what you do as a founder. You are talking with your in-house, let's say, uh, employees, with customers, mm. with partners, and all these suppliers. Stuff. Yeah, also exactly. Mm -hmm. So that's interesting. If you if you are talking with them every time when you start, like let's say before a meet, a general meet, you just ask them, "Hey, man, it's okay if I record that this discussion." It won't be as a public discussion about you, but I want to see how am I doing it. And if I can say something, maybe I can put it myself on my LinkedIn or on my Instagram or on my YouTube. So mm -hmm. in that way, you can have, let's say, your ghost content strategy. You just record them and you put it on a drive. And you have your mm -hmm. ghost strategy, uh, ghost content strategy that it's looking on your ideas. So you don't put the face on the customer. You don't put the face mm -hmm. on, the, on the audience. You just put your face there. Mm -hmm. And every time you have something to say, that ghost content strategist can take that small snippet of content. Maybe it's a video. Maybe, let's say, it's an uh, idea that can be written down as a LinkedIn post, as a newsletter, as, a, as an mm -hmm. article, as a blog article. And in that way, you just took your idea from from intimate from personal to public and that's how mm. you build it let's say in public but in yeah. the same time you don't need any way let's say any uh investment as resources to write down to figure it out how to publish it on linkedin you just you just invest those pr money that you already invested take mm. let's say 50 percent from that pay a person that, let's say, it's your own personal content strategist and it's helping you position yourself, let's say, as a tough leadership in the industry. And it's mm. very simple to start. Let's say, here's one idea that I said. You're already talking with the people. But let's say that you don't want to record. You feel embarrassed to ask them, hey, I want to record this a conversation. So you say that, hey, I want to be a, a, a content writer. But I know how to start. So you start, like, let's say, create a content. You write uh, a one piece of article, a one piece of 500 words of article. That's all you need. You write it down and you set it you have, like your story, your idea, like, everything there that should have like, after people will read that piece of content, they should leave with what one idea. So what's the one idea hmm. people will, will leave after consuming my content? After doing that, Send it to five, to 10 friends, sending directly to 10 friends and ask them, hey, what do you think about it? Is this crap or is this something that uh, I can start doing that? And in that mm. way, you will start getting, let's say, feedback and testimony. And maybe from 10 friends, seven will say, man, you're doing pretty great. Let's do that. And from that part, you will start like writing down for 90 days, day by day and publish it. Publish it, it doesn't matter like the engagement, it doesn't matter the impressions, it doesn't matter who will see, mm, it doesn't matter the, the stats. You just publish. Now you're building up this muscle of publishing. And today I just talk about with one of my friends about the idea with finite game and infinite game. What Simon Sinek is talking about in the infinite game. Like you're starting this lifestyle of something, but the infinite, the, but the finite game is that you're starting and then you finish it. And mm. what's next? But what's interesting is that I can't start like having this infinite game lifestyle if I don't understand the motivation after the finite game. Mm. So if I want to start building up muscles and if I want to be, get a little bit fit, I need like a motivation. And I will start like a diet for, let's say, 21 days or stuff like that. And after those 21 days, I can see like, Hey man, now I can take that shirt and 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 look good in that shirt. So okay, and now I can start like building up this uh, infinite lifestyle. So mm -hmm. this is with the content strategy too. So and what you're saying is you you know if you're if you're trying to build this as a practice because you think there is some merit uh, in doing it, then you are going to need some kind of a positive feedback loop at some point. But you Definitely. don't need much. But actually, that positive feedback loop is what continues to propel you in the future. Yes. For example, you know, uh, whilst uh, whilst you're in a Zoom conversation with, you know, you're talking about a customer, you're both kind of 
you know, you're both talking about how awful it is in your industry right now because there's this problem, this problem, this problem. And, you know, you just, whilst you're in the middle of the conversation, if you haven't recorded it, just write down, you know, write down one sentence on what whatever that kind of idea was that you were both uh, talking about. Write a small post, write a one minute, you know, record a one minute audio file, do something straight after that call if you haven't recorded it to capture that. Gather those ideas for 90 days, start publishing the ideas. But as soon as you... If one of your, if you were to show that to your team and they go, hey, that'd be an amazing piece of content for me to use in my email. You know, when I send out emails to customers who are at this stage, they would love to mm-hmm. hear something like that because it would show that we're current and we're thinking about the future and we understand what the problems are and it all builds our credibility as a team, as a brand of people who've got their finger on the pulse. Um, so yeah. it's still, you know, customers still interfacing with the business, but they're getting the value out of that founders. There um, are five benefits you you have uh, while building your personal brand. The first one is for your customers. They can start knowing about you, about the brand and everything. Then there is for, let's say, uh, the collaborate, the uh, partners. Like partners. Mm-hmm. Exactly. The one we can, you can, you can partnership and they want, hey, I want to partner with Sean because of, uh, I understand his mindset. I understand his, mm. uh, let's say, his purpose, his uh, his values, and I want to connect my values with his values. And now we are doing this podcast because we mm. connected. You you saw me what mm. this guy from Romania is doing, and hey, mm-hmm. now you you forgive me for rescheduling two times, but you really wanted to do this. <laughs> and I was like, man, Sean is just like a heaven sent for doing that because he's so he's so kind and now our values are connecting doing this podcast Mm -hmm. the third one there are the amplifiers the one that are are watching this let's say are watching this podcast or are consuming your content on linkedin and they just can just share it with their friends with their family with their colleagues or with just repost it on their profile and they are the Mm -hmm. amplifiers of your content and Mm -hmm. the fourth one there are the employees Employees need a voice outside and employees need to, let's say, brag about the person, brag about, let's say, as a, as a CEO that is not just like in the office, nobody knows him. There mm. is in, in the black office uh, with the, ter- with the light, with the lights turned off and they just don't, and he just don't want to come out and just talk yeah. and just to, uh, let's say, represent our company. We need a voice like the, the competition is having a voice and you should also have a voice. And the mm. fifth one is the new talent. You can mm-hmm. bring up mm. new talent because you have, because you have, let's say, a personal credibility. So this is what yeah. I'm, uh, I'm building up for. Yeah, I, I want to um, jump into a couple of those because I think that's, you know, I wasn't even thinking about a couple of those, but it's, it's super true. When you think about, because if I want to, I want to connect this into some of the things I know that founders really uh, think about. If you think about your team members, and you're a CEO, and part of what you're trying to do is have these kind of regular rhythms of communication, talking about the vision and all the rest. But it's quite a scripted, you know, um, presenty kind of a process. And this actually allows you allows your team to get inside the mind of you and hear how you, you know feel about things mm. and your philosophies and what's going on in the industry and no one else is going to give that to them but you don't actually have to direct it to them but they still have access to it and i think that's a really you know people often ask i, I hear this kind of myth like you know it's really you know, there's no one no one works hard anymore there's no discretionary effort no one will go above and beyond and i think did you would you ever go above and beyond for something that you don't care about and then mm. how can you expect your team to care about something that they don't understand Like if you, if you, you actually have to bring them into your world and to your point, the founder is usually very motivated by solving a particular kind of problem. So they are always thinking about uh, that problem. I think it's a really interesting opportunity for, uh, for employees or existing employees and the new talent side couldn't, um, couldn't agree with you more. We've done numerous podcasts on how do you access uh, impact players or A players, whatever you want to call it. Uh, Typically those people are not out there looking for jobs. Like they're yeah. gainfully employed, they're being paid well, they're being looked after. So you actually have to go and find those people. It's a proactive sourcing job. And so then the question is, if you're a small bit smaller business and you're trying to attract somebody who's already been to where you want to go, how are you going to attract them to your journey? Because they've got to get professional development. They've got to they've got to see something in that journey. And I tell you why they come. 
They come because of the founder. So how are you mm. going to attract them into the mind of the founder? Being able to send them small snippets from a podcast, let, allowing them to absorb and have their own experience of you where you're not having to talk directly to them. You know, you're talking about something else, they get access to that. New talent absolutely is a critical um, benefactor of you having a personal brand because they they come they come because of the founder. They come for almost no other reason other than the founder, more accountability where they are, con- concentrated really hardcore period of professional development because they're going to be super challenged. Um, but it comes from buying into the founder and their vision and their philosophies uh, in the first place. So this is an incredible way uh, to get access to that beyond the, the buyer's journey. So let me tell you, I don't know if you heard about Rand Fishkin. No. Rand Fishkin, he's one of the most smartest digital marketer in the world. Okay. So Rand, he built up Moz. It was one of the most best SEO tool in the world. I don't know where mm-hmm. are they now. So That's Rand, MOZ, is it Moz? Exactly, MOS. Yeah. So Sorry, Rand nice. Rand started like a blog. SEO Moz was a blog. And then he started like from and he started like building up blogging and doing the consultant stuff and then build up uh, SEO Moz as a tool. But then he went, uh, he went, uh, he exited uh, from Moz and he started a new tool. It was called the SparkToro. SparkToro was an audio, is now an audience research tool. Mm-hmm. And Moz and the Rand started writing content on the blog. And now you're a founder, and he also had his Twitter profile with hundreds of thousands of people following him. Mm-hmm. He's uh, writing, he's putting up a, a company, and he's doing the content, like writing on blog and everything, and sending the newsletter. Mm. So Rand start now, and now Rand, it's a blogger, it's a founder, let's say he's, he's already having his personal brand. But he have a lot of on his table and he hired Amanda Natividad. So Amanda, she's now a well-known person in the content marketing industry because she pointed out and she coined out the the term of zero-click content. But zero-click content, it was a a term that Rand Fishkin started with the zero-click search. When you start searching for for something, Google is giving you directly the answers on the front page. Mm -hmm. So now you are losing traffic from your website because people are not clicking to go on your website. And he's now building up on that. So on that foundation, Amanda came and she took all these responsibilities as a marketer, as blogger, as a social media marketer for, for SparkToro. And she started out like, uh, pointing out and coining out the idea on the zero click content. What's the zero click content? Mm-hmm. You are, because you want to help people, you are publishing on, on, on social media natively without asking people to click on your blog, to click on your podcast. And in that yeah. way, people started like con- associating your name with that category. And in that mm-hmm. way, we start building a, a credibility in that category. And from mm-hmm. that, from time to time, you can just, hey, I have a webinar. If that's something for you, feel free to, to, to sign up or stuff like that. But Amanda, because Rand had this, let's say, DNA of a content creator, for her, it was very easy to get in the company and to start like build upon that. And now we have like a company of three persons. It's Casey, who's the CTO. It's Rand, who's the CEO, and it's Amanda, who's the VP of marketing. And they are like doing a job of tens of people as marketers, as paid advertising, as SEO and Mm -hmm. everything, only Mm -hmm. build on these two personal brands. So that Mm -hmm. was very, very interesting to see in the B2B industry. You have the founder, you hire, let's say, a marketer with a creator DNA. And in that way, With these two, let's say, uh, powerful distribution tools, channels, if I can say that, your brand is just growing exponentially. So now we are living in the world where personal brand is not just the face of a cover. It's just like a happy 
picture with smiley faces and all this stuff mm-hmm. and a good about page. Because if you are sending me an email, hey, Robert, I want to connect with you. I want to start working with you. And I'm looking up at you, uh, at Googling you and LinkedIn you and tweeting you. And I won't say, I won't see anything about Sean. I'm just deleting that email. I'm sorry. Mm. But if I Mm. see that, hey, Sean is having a perspective, an idea, I can associate his name with business, with scaling up businesses, with helping people. Yeah, man, let's let's connect and see how we can work each other. Or maybe just like uh, being on, see that we can be on the same page and just being here. And whenever an opportunity is just pumping up, we can just talk about it. So this is what content is doing right now. And uh, there are a lot of, a lot of examples in the B2B industry. So that's why I believe that right now, not just the founders, but also, let's say, in-house creators, the people that can become the face of the companies, the people that can be, let's say, can build up their, their audience and people can start following them. And from time to time, they can just say that, hey, I'm working at this company and we are doing that. So if, it's, if you feel that it's working for you, just uh, sign, sign you up and let me know that how can I help. And that's all. Like mm. People are using social media not just to entertain, but also to inform and get informed, also to educate and get educated. So that's yeah. why a founder should and must understand the, the power of social media and content marketing. So, Robert, if you were a founder listening today um, and you were like, hmm, okay, Robert has changed my mind. I have been hiding in the shadows because uh, I didn't want to be attached to the marketing machine and I, didn't, I thought I would be sucked into the wheel and I would never be able to get out and my whole goal is to have this thing kind of run on its own or run under management or be able to sell it or whatever. Your challenge is, well, that's, uh, that's not... Um, it's not necessarily going to stop you doing that. You take Richard Branson. What a great example. You know, yeah. Virgin's not going to stop because, you know, Richard Branson's still got his own personal brand out there. He's part of the marketing machine in some ways, absolutely, because his reference point, he's out there evangelizing the brand and what it stands for. But he's not, he's not out there saying, we've got these fantastic products inside Virgin Airlines and we've got, you know, prices on this and blah, blah, blah. He's, you know, He's sort of living the values through him, his personal experiences, his professional experiences, he's sharing his perspective on issues that, you know, from, from his, his perspective matter. If you were, I'd heard a good, a good um, one of the guys I'd interviewed on this podcast had said, the best way to do start your content strategy is to figure out which, figure out the method that you are attracted to the most. Again, if you like talking, maybe a podcast. If you don't mind being on camera, maybe do a video. If you really like writing, do a blog, do a newsletter, do something. But whatever the starting point is for you, um, you know, lots of content can kind of fall off the back of it, but start with the one that makes the most sense that's going to have the least amount of resistance for you. My question for you is, let's say that you had a founder listening today. They're like, Robert's changed my mind. I want to get on this um, bandwagon, but I don't have time and nor do I want to get trapped in having to, I'm happy to capture the content opportunities. I'm happy to capture that conversation. I'm happy to write down that idea. I'm happy to, you know, notate that idea into audio. I'm happy to, you know, talk at ChatGPT for five seconds or whatever. And I want somebody else to figure out what to do with that content. Uh, what, how, would you, how would you guide them on what kind of skill set to look for? Uh, if you were going to only hire like kind of one person who's your sort of personal content marketer, what skills, what experience would you look for? Yeah. Okay. So... Uh, do you have a team or you are a solo founder? Let's assume you've got a team, but there's very okay. few in marketing. Um, okay. so let's assume, you know, you've got a whole business, it's got very few marketers in it. You've been kind of relying on agencies or whatever. Okay. Um, and then you're the founder. Do, can you hire somebody? Can you work with somebody or can yeah, you, you can pay more with some, to somebody from your team to help you with that? Mm, okay. Yeah. You could look internally into the team. Okay. For someone who has the natural skill, sure. Great. Okay. Let's say that you want to pay somebody with, I don't know, hey, man, I want to do that. I see that you're doing pretty well and I trust you because you're one of the first employees. So uh, help mm-hmm. me build that. Okay. So uh, you have a team and you want to pay somebody to do that for you. 
So from that part, you have only five, I believe there are five steps and that's helping me also when when I, I'm starting like thinking and working with my clients on that. So f- first of all, what's the one topic that you're ex- the expert for? What's the mm-hmm. one topic that uh, even your wife or even your husband is telling you that I'm sick of hearing you all days about this topic. And when you are looking at your Google search, you will see that everything is around that topic. And when you are, let's say, looking at your mm-hmm. YouTube channel, it's only about that topic. Maybe it's your industry. Maybe mm. it's something that you're passionate about and you saw that in your industry it's a problem. So it's one topic. So mm-hmm. that this should be. And one topic, for example, for example, for me, a topic is the B2B creator. So I'm coming up with the from from a background of B2B industry. And I also have this content creator DNA. So I mix them up. So it's a B2B creator. I am talking a lot about B2B creator. And now there are mm-hmm. two types of B2B creators. There are the external B2B creators, the founders like Sahil Bloom and Cody Sanchez, Sampar and all these parts that are talking to a B2B industry and creating content for a B2B industry. And at the same time, the B2B creators are also in-house creators that are creating content on their platform representing a company. They can be the Tim Davidson, they can be the uh, Todd Klaus from Lavender, they can be Obi Durani from uh, from uh, Hockey Stack. So these are the in-house creators that are building up their personal brand and building their audiences and connecting the audience with their with the company where they are w- working. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. this is my my category. This is my let's say my one topic. Yeah. My industry, it's in the B2B uh, industry, but mostly in the MarTech industry. So find mm-hmm. out your one topic and what's your industry. Yeah. If you have this one, what's the one type of content you can create, but you love and you also love to consume? Maybe you love to consume, uh, let's say, short videos. Hey, mm. I can be very, let's say, uh, energetic and I can, let's say, create like 25 uh, videos on a month and can be published. Okay, mm-hmm. that's great. So th- one type of content doesn't have to be like one hundred type of, one type of mm-hmm. content. The mm-hmm. other one is one platform. You should only focus on one platform. What's the one platform you want to leverage? And if you look back, the one platform is connected somehow with the one content. The one content is mm. somehow connected with the industry. The industry is somehow connected with the topic. And in the fourth uh, step should be the timeline. How long should I want to do that? And never do like three months. Always do like nine months, one year, or two years. Do mm-hmm. that and be consistent with that. Nobody will see results after like one month or three yeah. months because yeah. there is a lot of content and a lot of people are creating content. So you need time and people need time for, for them to establish you in their mind. And mm. after that, you have the purpose. Like, what do I want? What do I want to achieve? Writing all these things down and talking with that, let's say, with that personal content strategist, personal creator that is helping you building up your, uh, let's say, your your personal brand, your platform, your audiences. And from that, you can say like, hey, but make the purpose like more achievable. I want to build like 10,000 followers on LinkedIn. And I know these are vanity metrics, but these this can be also help you like go in this, let's say in this marketing machine. Because mm-hmm. from that, you can also write like, hey, I want to write a book. I want to be a speaker. I want to help the business like do an exit and all this stuff but create mm-hmm. like an achievable purpose in the yeah. amount of time you are putting out. So okay, starting yeah. from this, this will help you start, I believe even right now, because you have your pen, your paper, write down all this. And what's interesting, now go back after six months and look or three months when you are in this, in this journey and look at this topic, the industry, the content, the platform, the timeline, the purpose, Is anything can be changed so I can do my work better? Mm. And in that place, you are not alone. You are working with somebody. 
you can't do that alone because you also mm. can build a, a scalable business alone. Yeah, you can build yeah. a company of one, but that's not scalable. That's a lifestyle yeah. business. Yeah. And, you know, you uh, ultimately, I always say um, to my clients, you, know, you you can't be outside of the box when you're in the box. That's the problem. That's oh, why wow. people come to yeah. Scale HQ for advice. Like, you know, when you're inside the box, I need to get advice on Scale HQ from, pe- from people outside my box because mm. I might be really good at seeing outside someone else's box and I can see things they can't see, but I can't see outside my own. Uh, yeah. And that's an issue. So I agree with you. You've got to review with, uh, with somebody else. Otherwise, you get stuck in a rut. That's, yeah, man. I just want to re, you know, I'm conscious of how much time we've got left, but I really just want to reiterate those steps. If you feel like, if you have listened to this today and said, you know what? I think Robert's onto something. Here's an opportunity. Don't even go out and hire some person external to your business. Look at someone inside your team who's actually pretty savvy with marketing, knows you, trusts you, has good sort of creative ideas and go, okay, how do I get this person to help me? Maybe it's an over and above opportunity. Maybe you can take some of their tasks off them and give them to somebody else and start with those five steps. What's the one topic you're an expert at? What's your industry? What's the one content type you're going to focus on? What's the one platform you're going to publish and distribute on? How long are you going to do this for? Is it going to be a year, two years? I agree with you. Anything less than a year is um, is uh, a bit crazy. And you know, if you think about any exponential curve, it takes a long. It's like watching the grass grow. You know, it's like a property investment strategy. It does like nothing for ages and ages and ages, and all of a sudden it builds builds volume quite quickly towards the end. But you have to stick around for it. And then ultimately, your purpose. What's uh, what's some achievable goals? Um, that you can set for what you want this purpose to do, probably for your audience, but also what's a, what are some metrics or some goals that will make you feel like it's become valuable. Um, yeah. For me, for example, you know, when, when I set out to do this podcast, my goal was to make sure that I had different perspectives um, coming from other people on common problems that the founders that we support at Scale HQ would face because mm-hmm. I would never fall into the trap of thinking that I have all the ideas on something. So I wanted as many different perspectives so they can hear a lot of different perspectives and then choose the one that's right for them. Choose the one that resonates with them the most to solve that problem. And as a side benefit, knowing that I am building, you know, I've just released my first course on um, building growth strategy uh, for founders. I also wanted to record podcasts that would get sufficient content out that I can help inform the book that I will produce that will also match with the course. So there'll be a course, mm. there'll be a book. And a lot of that has going to be, has been informed by the podcast of the last two years. And so, yeah, I wasn't out there to, turn on some massive marketing machine for new customers actually had different goals um, than that. So yeah, I think that's really, really sound advice. And then make sure you go back every six months and, and do a review with somebody else uh, to see what you can uh, what you can do and improve. I'm conscious of our um, time, Robert. I know we're going to have to finish up. Is there, what's the, what's the one thing I haven't asked you or what's the thing that you really want to leave people with today to make sure they're thinking about this before they uh, walk away from today's podcast? And I really value the time that you have uh, you've spent with us today. If, Oh, wow. So, um, well, if they took the time to listen at the, uh, until this end, I believe that they already know what they should do and what they have to do. So all they have to do is just get that LinkedIn page, get that Twitter, get that whatever, or get that Google Docs, write down your, uh, your article and send it to your 10 friends and ask them for, for a feedback. And if they give mm-hmm. you the feedback, a positive feedback, then take, take that article and publish it on LinkedIn. And if, if this helped you a lot or this will help you like in a way or another, I believe that it would be like a great way to leave a review on this podcast or an Apple podcast or, or, or a comment or YouTube or whatever you are listening it and just tell Sean if you started. And if you started, like, how, uh, where do you want to go and how is this journey working for you? And maybe there will be a lot of people that are writing down or maybe there will be one or two, but just saying this to somebody and also saying this in public, hey, hey I'm on this journey, that will be like a great relief for, for these people. That's awesome. Robert, thank you so much. And uh, I'm really uh deeply grateful for the, the time that you spent in, uh, in sharing your knowledge uh, so freely. How would you encourage, if people wanted to learn more about um, the B2B uh, Creator Newsletter uh, or to get in touch with you or ask you any questions, how would they get in touch with you or how would you encourage them to follow along with what you're doing? If they, if they want to get in touch with me and they are listening to this podcast or watching this podcast, go on my LinkedIn and just uh, write me a message. Hey, I, I was listening to you on the Scale, Scale HQ podcast and 
I want to contact you. I want to talk with you. Or if you want to know more about the B2B creator industry, more about how the smart in-house creators are creating content or attracting audience or maintaining the audience, just sign up to the newsletter and uh, and read it, not just signing up. Just and also read it <laughs> and reply if if it if this will help you. That's awesome, Robert. Thank you, uh, thank you so much. Uh, you know, big big outtakes uh, for me around. This is a really interesting way for founders probably to come out of the shadows, uh, find a way to get cut through, it, and actually talk about stuff that they're really passionate about already. Like they're already passionate about this industry. They're already passionate about the problems. They're already talking to customers. This is not new stuff that you need to do you get somebody alongside you to kind of pick this up and turn it into something as you go but these are already experiences you're happening so it's actually a very efficient way of you helping your brand and your people get greater cut through in your positioning uh, of your business because if you've got something to offer if you've got something better to offer the market than all of your competitors then it is absolutely incumbent upon you it is your obligation to figure out how to scale and if this is the thing that gets your brand better cut through than anything else that you've done then it's worth it's worth trying so uh, yeah. I really encourage people to uh, to listen to, uh, as, as Robert said, leave those reviews, check in with Robert. Uh, please feel free to uh, to ask questions and we're very grateful for your time today. Robert Katai, thank you so much uh, from Scale HQ and our community. Thank you very much for this awesome discussion. My pleasure. Speak to you soon. The team here at Scale HQ hope you've enjoyed today's episode. Now, if you want to achieve scale, but you want to know what's going to hold you back, we can help. Head over to scalehq.com.au forward slash growth score to get your free nine page growth score report. That's going to help you understand where your top three barriers are to scale. And if you'd like, we'll even do a free debrief on the report for you with no obligations or expectations, just lots of value from some CEOs who've scaled to help you on your journey. That's scalehq.com.au forward slash growth score and find out what's holding you back from fulfilling the potential of your business today.